So thank you so much. And I want to introduce our panelists. So first we have Professor Christopher Clary, who is an assistant professor of, Rock, of political science at Rockefeller College. His research focuses on the sources of cooperation in interstate rivalries, the causes and consequences of nuclear proliferation, US defense policy, and the politics of South Asia. Previously, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University, a pre-doctoral fellow at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard University, a Stanton Nuclear Security pre-doctoral fellow at the RAND Corporation, and a Council on Foreign Relations International Affairs Fellow in India. Dr. Clary also served as Country Director for South Asian Affairs in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, a research associate at the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California, and a research assistant at the Henry L. Stimson Center in Washington, D.C. So thank you, Professor Clary, for joining us today. Um, we also have Professor Brian Early, who is an associate professor at Pol of political science and associate dean for research at Rockefeller College. Dr. Early is also the founding director of the Project on International Security, Commerce, and Economic Statecraft, and served as the director of the Center for Policy Research from 2015 to 2019. He has published 28 peer-reviewed academic articles on the topics such as economic sanctions, weapons of mass destruction, security issues, shadow economies, and political violence. His book, Busted Sanctions, Explaining Why Economic Sanctions Fail, provided the first comprehensive explanation of how and why countries undercut economic sanctions via the trade and aid they provide to sanctioned states. Ms. Jamie Morse has spent 20 years in state government working in homeland security and cybersecurity intelligence. Mm -hmm. Professor Morse earned a bachelor degree from the College of Holy Cross and a master of public administration with a homeland security concentration right here at UAlbany. She's an adjunct professor at the University of Albany since 2016, teaching courses in homeland security and intelligence analysis. Thank you for joining us. With that, we'll turn it over to the panelists for opening remarks, starting with Professor Clary, then Professor Early, and then Professor Morse. Thanks, Charles and Brittany and, and uh, Sia for hosting the event. Um, it's, uh, you know, that's a, the danger of, of, of being a security expert as all as us on the panel are, is that one gets to talk more when things are going badly uh, than when things are going well in the world. But that's. That's where we are, as Charles indicated at the outset. Um, I'll make my op opening remarks pretty brief so that we can save time for, for Q&A um, and, and go where the, the audience and uh, the moderators want us to go. Let me share my screen real quick because I think it is important to talk a little bit about what's going on uh, on the ground in, um, in Ukraine. So can you see that OK? Let me. See, uh, there we go. Thanks, Farzine, for that thumb. It's a great thumb. Okay. Um, you would think at this point in the in the pandemic, I would be better at knowing what's showing on the screen on my on my thing. But here we are. Uh, am I showing the presenter view to all of you? Yes. Yeah, that's fine. I'm not going to mess with it. So Ukraine's big. Uh, it's uh, so this is a non-trivial task, right? The the obviously Russia invaded the eastern part of Ukraine and the Crimean Peninsula in 2014 with mostly sort of covert gray area operations. Um, so, but before that, you know, it, it fought a war with Georgia and Georgia, the country is, is just much, much smaller. This it, Russia hasn't tried to do something of this level of effort really in a, in a long time, arguably since World War II. Uh, it intervened in, in Poland and, and um, and it intervened in Czechoslovakia and Hungary during the Cold War, but those those were from a much easier position of military placement. Um, just topographically, you know, the dominant feature of Ukraine is this river that goes through, you know, like an S shape through the middle of the country, the Dnieper River. Uh, it is, it's one of the world's great rivers. It's really a non-trivial um, body of water. And I think before the current operations, people thought that that would be a plausible boundary if Russia were ever 
to try to seize Eastern Ukraine to create a, to create a more defensible barrier uh, between the Russian state and, and, and the you know, NATO allied West. Um, you know, the challenge for that is Kiev, the capital, sits right on the northern part of that river. And so if you, it, it spills over on both sides. And so it, it kind of necessarily takes you to the west bank of the Dnieper if you begin operations. But as you can also see in this topographic map, as you get to the southwest corner of Ukraine, the topography becomes a little more challenging. It's not just an open space. And then the other issue with Ukraine is there are just a lot more people, and they and 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 this is a population density map. So you you know you see the really dark colors around Kiev in the middle, but the the southwest or or western corner of Ukraine is is pretty populous and also has Ukrainian. Um, you know, high, higher rates of Ukrainian speakers. These are people that may be less likely to want to live under a Russian puppet state. And so as Russia goes further west, um, besides the difficult task of taking Kiev itself, it's it's just really challenging to, will be really challenging for it to govern um, a puppet state that includes the far, far west of the country. Uh, the operations have, have focused on the north and the south. Um, Russia, as I mentioned, had held control of the Crimean Peninsula since 2014, as well as about half of the breakaway, uh, what it calls republics of Donetsk and Luhansk. Um, you know, so that those are serving in part as a, a base of operations. There's a big siege of the city of Kharkiv right now um, going on, uh, as well as the siege of Kiev in the in the north. Um, and I think it's. I'll stop sharing now. Uh, you know, I think the the where we stand is it, it's it's fair to say the the Russian military has behaved has performed much less well than people anticipated. Um, it's unclear how much less well it is performing compared to what Vladimir Putin anticipated. Uh, but this is a, a military that that seems like it's it's not doing the basics very well. Uh, there are challenges associated with having a lar large conscript force. Um, and it's and it seems rickety. It just seems like they've cut corners for a decade on on training and uh, equipping the force, and those those um, those seams are showing uh, against a more determined Ukrainian resistance than than perhaps uh, the Russians anticipated. Ukraine has been the beneficiary of Western aid uh, in an intense way since 2014, and it, that seems to have had some benefit. But the you know my bottom line um, is that. The Russian military is still very, very big, and and then that size can compensate for a lot of these qualitative shortcomings that we've seen, and you know it's it is still the case that they have they they have an enormous advantage on the battlefield, um, and and the the problem is for them to execute that advantage is probably going to involve uh, the use of artillery and rockets and missiles in ways that are very injurious to 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 human life, to civilian life. And, it's, and I think we have a, a still have a very nasty week ahead of us. Um, there are talks between the Ukrainians and the Russians. I, I, I'm skeptical that that will lead to anything. Uh, Vladimir Putin spoke to uh, Emmanuel Macron, the French leader today. Uh, the French came away from that conversation believing Putin was not close to looking for an off ramp. Uh, so I think we still have some very violent days ahead of us. Um, and I look forward to hearing what the other panelists have to say as well as the Q&A. So I'll go ahead and jump in. Hi, I'm Professor Brian Early, and I'd like to once again uh, thank, thank Charles uh, for giving us, me the opportunity to present to you all today. So what I want to focus my remarks on is what the West has done in response to Vladimir Putin's invasion. And just to, to provide a little bit of court historical context, when Russia invaded uh, Crimea, the Crimean Peninsula uh, back in 2014, it took the United States and Europe and other countries a number of weeks to kind of establish what was going on, uh, what the facts were on the ground. And then after it took uh, that, that several week process, it took both the United States and Europe time to formulate an appropriate response and then impose sanctions. And there was a lot of kind of diplomatic back and forth uh, about uh, um, what uh, what exactly the appropriate level of sanction should be? How severe should that response uh, actually be made? I just got a got a note that people can't see me. Um, am I coming in on other people's screens? Um, no, it appears as if your camera is off. 
my camera is off. Um, I, I can see Brian, so it must be. It said this meeting is in focus mode. You can see only the host videos and shared content and the videos of spotlighted participants. That I see that this this is probably my fault. I'll turn off focus mode. Okay, there we go. Yes. I just spotlighted him for everyone. All right. Thank uh, you. Well, hi, everybody. Um, and so I want to contrast that with what happened now. Uh, the, the United States and Europe in response to um, Vladimir Putin's regime, first declaring the Eastern provinces uh, independent republics, uh, was immediate. Um, and then after the invasion started, uh, the United States and Europe responded uh, with what, and, and it's not hyperbole to say, the most powerful, strongest sanctioning package against a great power that's, that's pretty much ever been launched in the, the history of, of modern times. This, is, this was the, a diplomatic equivalent of, of um, um, launching the, the, the Death Star in terms of sanctions. I mean, the, the sanctions that, that uh, uh, the United States and the West put into place, including sanctioning major Russian banks, such as the Central Bank, um, um, imposing massive uh, sanctions on strategic trade. So already many governments had regulated uh, mil direct military trade involving Russia, but there's a secondary set of, of commodities called dual use commodities that have both commercial and military and potential military applications. And so Russia had been subject to some, some of those restrictions after it invaded uh, Crimea, but uh, uh, the new restrictions that went out cut off Russia um, to almost all sorts of, of uh, dual use technologies and in a way that will be crippling to its energy sector, to its uh, aerospace sector, to um, just, just pragmatically anything that involves uh, high tech, uh, they are going to be cut off from. And, and what's, what's fairly remarkable is that uh, the sanctions that, that were spearheaded by the US and Europe have been um, joined by other countries such as Japan, Taiwan, um, um, Canada. So, so these are multilateral sanctions that went into place within a matter of days. Um, and that other than a little quibbling by about whether or not a luxury goods should be included or not, um, all of a sudden, everybody's on board with these sanctions and they're going in, into place. And they're already starting to have a massive disruptive effect on the, the Russian economy. The value of the ruble has, has plummeted uh, 40 to 50 percent. Uh, the Russian government's putting into place uh, emergency uh, provisions such as it's closed its stock market, it's imposed capital controls. So it, it's trying to stop uh, a, an economic disaster from breaking out that could be on the level that it experienced in the 1990s. And so, so when I, I talk to my students in my global security class about economic sanctions, I say sanctions can be used as scalpels or sledgehammers. Uh, and in this case, they're being used both as scalpels and sledgehammers. It's not neither or. So some of the sanctions are going after oligarchs, which are uh, the powerful wealthy elite within Russia um, that are thought to have profited through their connections to the state, through connections to Vladimir Putin and corruption um, that have uh, garnered hundreds, if not billions of dollars uh, uh, through um, illicit or corrupt means um, and are enjoying wealthy um, kind of elite level lifestyles far superior to, to everyone else in, in, in the country. And much of that wealth is actually exists outside of Russia. Um, so the, the scalpel like provisions are going after oligarchs. The US Department of Justice just launched a major initiative to go after the ill-gotten gains of these oligarchs and to actually find where they've hidden the money. Um, it's fairly remarkable, for example, that, that a place like Switzerland has joined the sanctions, which is traditionally neutral. Um, so, so that's really, really, really significant. And so uh, this is going to have both short-term impact um, on Russia in terms of, of creating economic costs uh, for the country. Um, and I think it's important to say that it's going to affect the oligarchs, uh, but we are, the international community has imposed sanctions with also a sledgehammer style consequences. Is this is, these sanctions are ultimately going to do dramatic harm to the Russian people, everyday Russian people as well. Um, the, we are inflicting 
sig significant economic damage um, that in the weeks and months ahead um, are, are going to put in place a, a crisis for the Russian people, and it's going to cause itself widespread harm. So I think that's really important to understand about the sanctions is it, there's the fighting, which is, is awful and terrible, uh, but sanctions do have costs as well. Um, the other thing, the more long-term thing, is the controls on strategic technology. Um, I think they are going to have some start having some battlefield applications and and um, and media effects. Um, Russia has been cut off of a lot of spare parts that its military potentially use, or the components necessary to fabricate the spare parts that its military will need. Um, so we are looking at at maybe maybe the sanctions not having an immediate battlefield impact. Um, but once shortfalls starting start to arise, a Russia that already, as, as my colleague Professor Clarity uh, acknowledged, has, has a little bit rickety, um, probably undermined or hollowed out through a lot of corruption and mismanagement. That they're going to they, they're going to need spare parts and they're going to need things to be refurbished and fixed up, and they're not going to have the ability to do that. Um, in the longer run, uh, I think the the sanctions are going to um, really harm. Uh, Russia's energy sector. They're going to really harm um, Russia's ability um, to maintain its military um, and its broader level of economic development. And it's going to look for outlets. It's going to look for partnerships with places like China, uh, which it already has in, in signing a deal to sell grain and uh, oil to, to uh, China um, in, a, in a recently negotiated deal. Uh, but Russia's main outlet to the world and to the world economy is likely going to become China. Um, and so I think the what, what's really interesting in terms of the geopolitical implications of this is the relationship, I think, between Russia and China might flip a little bit. Um, Russia is going to be very dependent on China, um, uh, in my view, as a result of this conflict is, is one of the longer term structural consequences. Um, so in the short run, I think I think uh, uh, Russia. Um, I don't know. I don't think sanctions are changing the nature of what's going on in the ground in Russia in the really immediate term. But the longer this conflict plays out, the the more sanctions are going to um, affect uh, the battlefield capabilities of of Russian forces, in my view. Um, and the more really significant costs are going to mount uh, within Russia. Uh, both at the elite level uh, and at the and in the uh, level of everyday Russians, uh, what's what's hard to know about sanctions is can the politic can they be effective? They can be impactful, but not effective at a, at achieving their coercive goals. So they are going to impose significant costs. They have already imposed significant costs. But the big question is, uh, will those economic costs? Will the the uh, constraints on on Russia's military? Are those going to be significant enough to put pressure on Vladimir Putin uh, to make concessions that that um, at the at at the uh, bargaining table in terms of of withdrawing from Ukraine um, under under what circumstances um, that that's the question. Um, certainly, um, they're providing counter leverage uh, against the reality that Putin can establish on the ground. Um, and that's the one final thing that uh, I, I want to leave you with is a consideration of why are we imposing the sanctions? I've highlighted that they can constrain Russia, both in the short term and long term. I've highlighted um, that it's it's the international community kind of coming together in response and opposing Russia and punishing what it what it's doing. And then finally, this point of um, to change Russia's behavior. And there are certain sanctions that we're going to want to leave in place because we don't want Russia getting more powerful after this. Um, the, the sanctions on high tech, uh, on, on dual use goods. I don't see those leaving. I, I see that being a real structural alignment, similar to what happened during the Cold War, of countries saying we can't sell Russia stuff that will contribute to Russia's military strength. Uh, I don't see those going away. Um, and the second part is, is the really hard part. We want to punish Russia for potential war crimes that it's engaged in through violating the sovereignty of Ukraine. And so there are the sanctions that are meant to stigmatize, to isolate, to punish. Uh, but at the same time, if the goal is how do we get Russians out of Ukraine and how do we get them out in a way that 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 um, is 
potentially least worse for Ukraine. Um, then some of the sanctions that you want to leave on, on Putin to punish his regime, to punish his oligarchs, um, that, that uh, uh, you're doing because you, you, your visceral response to that bad behavior and you want to punish it, um, you're going to have to be willing to relinquish some of those um, in order potentially at the bargaining table uh, to get concessions in return. And so I think that's what's playing out right now, um, is that Putin is, is escalated his military tactics. Uh, he, I think he he's racing against the clock because the mount, costs of the sanctions are going to mount. And I think he's trying to establish the most powerful negotiating position on the ground that he possibly can, so that when he's ready to strike a deal, um, that he's going to be in a position to potentially peel back some of these sanctions in addition to uh, whatever sort of deal he wants to strike to have a maintained presence in parts of Ukraine um, or conditions that that uh, might pertain to Ukraine's ability to join NATO uh, or other things. So um, I think that's that's potentially, I, I, that's my view of, of Vladimir Putin's strategy. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Professor Early. Um, now we would move to opening remarks from Professor Morse. Yeah, I just unmuted myself. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, I apologize for the uninspiring background like my co-presenters here. Um, so uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jamie Morse. I'm adjunct professor at Albany. Um, again, I'd like to echo uh, my thanks to Charles and Brittany and the rest of the team here for inviting me to participate today. Uh, so the focus of my opening remarks is just to talk about um, the U.S. intelligence and the run up to the invasion. Um, and what I like to do whenever I start talking about intelligence is just to define it for the audience and make sure everybody's operating off the same page, right? So you hear information and intelligence often used um, at the same time for the same meaning, um, but there is a difference. So information is just sort of like raw pieces of data that have not been evaluated, interpreted, or analyzed. And intelligence is what happens after analysts put um, the raw information, the data through a process that we call the intelligence cycle, where it is interpreted and evaluated for some sort of meaning and given to a policymaker or decision maker for them to use. So it's information that's been analyzed uh, for some value. And so what's been going on at the federal intel community over the past few months and years, um, intel community member agencies have analysts that focus specifically on Russia and Russia issues and what is the threat there uh, to our national security, all for the, uh, in the scope of their own respective missions, but they've been looking at um, what Putin was thinking of doing uh, with respect to Ukraine um, and collecting data through various intelligence collection mechanisms and analyzing it and giving it to uh, the decision makers at their agencies and uh, the president, of course. So what we saw uh, in the run up to this invasion um, is the White House um, making these sort of highly unusual releases of the intelligence that we had on uh, what Putin was planning on doing. Um, they don't often do that. You see sometimes intelligence getting leaked to the press um, for various reasons, but this was a really conscientious, conscientious effort from the administration to provide transparency because what was Putin trying to do? He was ramping up all this propaganda um, trying to put a bad light on Ukraine and the Ukrainian government, um, calling them Nazis, saying that they were trying to develop weapons um, to use against uh, Russia to sort of intimidate NATO and the European Union from accepting Ukraine into those alliances. And it, it was all a bunch of nonsense. So the U.S. community wanted to put that out there, one for transparency so that Putin really couldn't be fooling anyone, um, also really to allow Ukraine to further plan, um, perhaps if what the U.S. intelligence community and its allies were doing were perhaps trying to delay Putin's actions, um, ultimately deter it, but as we saw that um, was not working, um, really just to kind of put that out there and, and help Ukraine Teams, um, protect themselves um, as best they can to the run-up. Um, we, we often see the U.S. intelligence community uh, criticized for their failures. Um, there's a great 
quote by uh, a former British terrorism scholar, Paul Wilkinson, um, who says that fighting terrorism is a lot like being a goalkeeper. You can make a hundred billion saves, but the one that shot that people remember is the one that gets by you. And I think that's really true of intelligence as well, right? Um, the successes that the intelligence community has to prevent uh, preventing acts um, from happening isn't usually publicized, but the failures are. So there was a lot of uh, people looking at what the intel community doing, and I think that you know they got it right in this instance. The analysts uh, were able to accurately project that Putin was going to um, invade. I had uh, my students actually uh, the day uh, before uh, Putin launched his full-scale invasion in class. We were talking about forecasting, which is what uh, strategic analysts do to to predict. Um, what's going to be happening in the future with respect to whatever security issue that they're working on. And so half the class had the question of whether or not Putin would launch a full-scale invasion in Ukraine in the next couple of weeks. And the groups that had that problem uh, accurately predicted that he would based on them going out and collecting data and analyzing it um, on the threat and the history of Putin's actions and the regime itself um, with some fairly um, high certainty and high likelihood of probability that he would do that and four hours later in fact like he did so um hopefully that taught the the, anal, uh, the students in class what it was like to be an analyst for a few hours that day um so again just to kind of recap um u.s community was able to accurately predict what russia was going to be doing they were able to get that information out there in the public in an authorized way to try to help deter and at least provide awareness to our allies on what Putin was actually planning on doing and ultimately i think had some success um, in getting it right this time so we're gonna um th thank you very much uh professor morse um uh, we are gonna start now with our our q a um and so uh, Brittany and i are going to be kind of trading off questions at first but while we're doing this for all of you out there in the audience if you have any questions uh please just drop them into the chat i see we have one already but um you know we're, we're going to make sure that we have some time to to hopefully get to everybody's questions um so um i want to start with a question i i think um you know, maybe all of you could speak to is, you know, the the threat of massive sanctions in this instance, like clearly didn't work as a deterrent. Um, and I think Professor Early from your, um, you know, that we're, we're dealing with, a, you know, really huge multilateral and very swiftly implemented sanctions here, very different from what Russia experienced even in 2014. Um, but still, um, you know, the, this threat didn't act as a deterrent. Whereas now, you know, we're seeing uh, Russia you know, pretty freely wield its its uh, nuclear arsenal uh, as a deterrent from direct military invention, uh, intervention rather. Um, and so I, I'm curious if you have any thoughts about how this current crisis and, and the lessons of this might affect the future of non-proliferation. Well, I, I can speak to um, a little bit on, on kind of the your question. So, yeah, ec economic sanctions are policies that that uh, often don't succeed, and and there's a number of reasons why they don't succeed. Um, as I kind of mentioned, um, the first challenge with economic sanctions is that they have to be impactful first in most cases in order for them to be effective second. And so uh, that's one of the initial uh, probably calculations that Vladimir Putin had in this case, is if he looked back to what happened after Crimea, um, the sanctions that, that the US and Europe imposed were pretty weak. There was a lot of quibbling about them. And actually, there was internal dissension within Europe about whether the sanctions against uh, Russia should be maintained. And so in terms of there being a deterrent, even though the US and, and Europe uh, was committing to uh, uh, imposing massive sanctions. I think it was an open-ended question about how severe the sanctions would be. And, and Russia had reasons to, to question uh, the West credibility. Uh, places like Germany were highly dependent on um, fossil fuel supplies coming, uh, coming from uh, Russia. Um, a lot of European countries traded, were trading with Russia and, and valued that relationship much more than the US. And so uh, um, Russia and Vladimir Putin had already internalized the fact that some sanctions would be coming. They knew that. That was part of their calculus. So in order to be deterred, they had to have expected um, that the sanctions 
potentially could far exceed uh, what they were anticipating uh, kind of within the boundaries of, of, of a tolerable range of, of kind of medium level sanctions. And so I, I don't think that, that Russia, uh, for example, expected to have its central bank uh, uh, targeted. I, I mean, that very, I, I mean, unprecedented for a great power. Um, getting kicked out of SWIFT was pretty significant. Um, the strategy of, of blocking uh, Russia's ability to use its $640 billion uh, uh, war chest of funds, um, some of a lot, large part of which was, was located out of the country. I don't think that entered their mind. I, I, I don't think they maybe were creative enough or that their, their intelligence about uh, what the West was planning was, was good enough. So you're right uh, that sanctions weren't an effective deterrent. And, and I think part of it is you look at, you look at Russia's interpretation of, of how dependent some of the bodies were uh, upon Russia. You look at Russia's view of how the West had responded with, with kind of um, uh, mediocre sanctions to its aggression in the past. And there was a failure to think about all the creative options um, on an economic statecraft basis um, that uh, the Biden administration was preparing and and slowly building. I mean, when when I said this this was a this was a huge diplomatic um, um, and it, and and administrative undertaking for by Bi the Biden administration to coordinate having the capacity to put these sanctions in place so quickly. I I, I just I, I for those of you who are wondering why isn't the West doing enough. What they have done is is almost it's unprecedented. So it, it it's truly remarkable, and and I don't think that that maybe Putin uh, um, anticipated. I don't think that Putin anticipated that happening. So that's on the the, the deterrent basis. But um, kind of the second part of that um, is that normally when we think of economic sanctions, we think of them as compellent tools as opposed to deterrent. Tools and and for those of you taking Professor Clary's class or my my class about the distinctions between compellence and, and deterrence, um, compellence is is generally much harder than than um, deterrence. And so, um, if if Putin fails to be deterred by sanctions because he doesn't take the threat credible enough, um, sanctions to change their behavior to publicly. Uh, force Putin to submit. Um, we're doing, the, the West and Europe is doing something to impose costs, to force a change in behavior of Putin. That, that's embarrassing, that, that, come, that cuts it as his credibility and Russia's credibility. Um, so part of the reasons that sanctions don't succeed is they're more often used as compellent tools. And, and frankly, um, sanction, one of the big determinants of whether sanctions succeed or fail um, is how big of an objective uh, are they trying to succeed? And military adventurism or, or actually um, stopping uh, parties who are involved in a conflict using or limiting yourself to solely affecting their economic welfare, it's, it's really hard to do. Um, if states have committed uh, um, themselves uh, based on their national interest to use military force, um, the types of sanctions that typically get imposed, the cost they impose, aren't significant enough uh, normally uh, to challenge that. And so that's where I, I do wanna say that, that the sanctions the US and, and Europe and other countries of the world have joined in, I mean, they, they really are uh, imposing a level of cost that, that might be significant enough to alter the calculus of, of Vladimir Putin and, and Russia. Uh, but, but sanctions aren't probably going to, to lead to an uh, complete surrender. They didn't lead to a complete surrender in the case of Iran when you're talking about non-proliferation. Uh, what they led was to the bargaining table uh, in which the sanctions themselves became a bargaining chip to, to reach a deal. And so that's, that's what I'm seeing here. You're not going to see the sanctions lead to Russia's utter capitulation. That, that's not happening and nobody should have that in their minds as, as, as an outcome that, that's realistic. Um, as, as I kind of alluded to, sanctions are going to be potentially, though, uh, going to be part of a package that could lead to um, a, a swifter or maybe more favorable outcome um, through negotiation um, than would otherwise have occurred. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, let, let my co-panelists chime in. Yeah, I just... 
I want to just emphasize something that Brian said. You know, one challenge we have is we really are in an unprecedented place. Even if you think about like a similar amount of um, sanction pressure on a state like Iran or, or North Korea, in many cases, those sanctions were slowly brought up over a period of many years. And so we don't know how a great power first responds to this sudden increase of very intense sanctions. And then I think what is also un clear um, is how much diversion Russia can do of various sorts of trades to the few people that are still buying it, India, China. Um, you know, Russia has non-trivial leverage, particularly if it takes over Ukraine, uh, you know, major sources of global wheat exports between the two of them, uh, oil and natural gas, obviously. Titanium, Boeing CEO says they've stockpiled enough titanium to produce jets for a while, but not indefinitely if they are cut off from Russian titanium. So they'd have to redesign their jets or, or you know, there's just not that many places to get titanium on the planet at the scales we're talking about. Uh, some things like neon gas, I'm pretty confident can be rerouted through other suppliers. Palladium also probably you can, you know, but, but my point, there are, these sanctions are gonna have this immediate effect on the Russian stock market that will have an immediate effect on the Russian economy. There's all sorts of other things going on. The entire Russian aero, um, you know, aviation sector relies on Irish leased planes. All those planes have to go back to Europe. That nobody, nobody, <laughs> Russians can't fly anywhere, right? It's 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 this very intense period of pain. And the closest analogies we have are the sorts of pressures states face under wartime. And the evidence we have from that is that states are pretty good at weathering that. But the the it's weird because we 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 just the information environment in Russia is weird. We don't know how battened down the regime is uh, to these sorts of pressures. Uh, but typically, sanctions, even embargoes combined with bombing campaigns, great powers have been able to weather that. And my take is consistent with the betting markets that you know if you look right now and predict it, they say there's only about a 25% chance that Putin is removed by the end of the calendar year. And if you think that Putin is less likely to survive than that, you should go put a hundred bucks on it. Um, I mean, that's a way to 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 conform with that. But I, I think that's about right. That much more likely than not, Putin is there to survive. And then I think we have to think about what a pariah Russia means to the global order. Like we haven't had to deal with that in really a long time. The Russia of the 80s and the 70s was a pain in the butt, but it was it was a co-manager of the international system. And now I think we could be pushing Russia to be almost a um, you know. A client state of China, and I don't know what if we've thought about the effect of that a year from now. I don't know what other choice we had. We can't allow great powers to just invade their neighbors on a whim. Um, but it's it's we're really in in very confusing territory that we don't have a lot of good historical analogies to help guide us to understand. Uh, just quickly from an intel perspective, so the role of the analysts at the State Department was to provide intelligence to um, Secretary of State and others that are trying to make the decisions on what sorts of lever uh, sanctions to leverage and how much and how quickly. Um, going forward, the analysts are going to be looking at um, trying to ascertain how Putin is actually reacting to these sanctions and kind of trying to get to his mindset, which is um, proven to be pretty difficult, but kind of as this um, invasion plays out, uh, trying to collect intelligence, trying to identify new sources that are able to provide truthful information to try to assess his state of mind um, is going to be cr critical for the analysts to try to get their hands on. Charles, do you want us to start answering some questions from the chat chat window? Um, I, th I think Brittany has a question, and then I think we have another 15 minutes here, and then uh, we'll we'll start to transition to the audience okay. questions. Yeah, I've been keeping track of um, the questions to make sure that we're um, going in order of that. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for answering that question. Um, my question is in terms of um, intelligence priorities, but it also relates to um, state level priorities in terms of policy or um, any type of kind of policy going towards Ukrainian citizens or Russian citizens going forward. Um, so 
how has those priorities changed since the invasion of Ukraine and what do you kind of um, see in the forecast for policy on the state level um, in terms of addressing the invasion? Your, your question, Brittany, is like how U.S. policy toward Ukraine itself has changed since the invasion. Is that is that right? I'm muted. Um, I also wanted to um, kind of know what the policy state level um, is in terms of um, any type of in, um, immigration, any type of refugee protection. Um, cybersecurity has been a huge concern on the state level. Um, so what kind of do you see going forward in terms of uh, state policy or federal policy? Pro Professor Morris, you may be better poised on New York, right? Um, so in terms of any kind of like intelligence priority, I think that was woven into one of your questions, Brittany. Um, so at the state level, what we're looking at is what sort of threats uh, might come down on New York State or the homeland um, as a result of this invasion. And what we are getting from our federal uh, partners is that cyber attacks might be the most likely um, course of action for the Russian government or uh, pro-Russian cyber criminal groups to enact um, on state networks. And so, um, you know, we're always kind of looking at threats from nation state actors in the cyber environment, uh, Russia being one of them. So that hasn't really changed, but um, there has been an uptick in, in outreach and partnerships between the state level, um, private sector, and the federal government in terms of what to look out for and how they can better protect our network. So that seems to be sort of um, the highest priority uh, these pro-Russian cyber criminal groups have said outright that we're going to come after and target critical infrastructure from the cyber perspective of any countries that are supporting Ukraine. And so we would certainly fall under that category. Um, in terms of your uh, refugee question, uh, we, we tend to work with the federal government and we've been working with them with respect to the Afghan refugees that they've been coming in to the country and uh, uh, settling in parts of New York. So I would think that that would be no different um, if the Ukrainian refugees come over to the United States. Um, whenever there's a conflict like this, we're also looking at any kind of threats that there might be to diaspora populations um, in our state or in any state. Again, uh, the network of fusion centers across the country uh, shares information about how to better protect um, these diaspora populations and working with the federal government. So we'll be um, looking to the feds to provide us guidance. We'll be doing outreach to citizens at the like, local law enforcement level um, to talk to them about any concerns that they might have and, and be able to provide that sort of like community policing to them uh, going forward. So that's how that might um, tie into the, any kind of refugee population or diaspora population that exists in New York State. Thank you. I think Charles also has a, another question. Sure. I, I think I'll, I'll do one more because we're, we're starting to get lots in the, uh, in the chat um, and they got some great questions. So uh, we'll move on to those uh, shortly. But um, I think kind of broadly speaking, you know, regardless of how this conflict ends, it does seem that the, the post-war order in Europe uh, is going to be fundamentally changed. Um, you know, uh, could, do you guys have any insights about what the, the future security architecture of, of Europe might look like uh, moving forward from here on? You know, it's, you know, predictions are hard, always about the future. Those are particularly hard too. But, uh, you know, what, what have we seen? I mean, I think, you know, part of the reason, let me back up. If we think the sanctions surprised Putin at their severity, which I think they did, then that's a, a failure to some extent, because if you had signaled the severity, you might have been able to deter him, right? Now, part of the challenge is the coalition you were able to build were shocked and angry about the brazenness of what actually unfolded. It's one thing for the US intelligence community to say repeatedly and loudly with a lot of precision that this was going to happen. And I think we got buy-in from most of our, our long-term allies. But then once it actually began unfolding in a really kind of ham-handed way, you got a lot of people to come off the margins. 
um, it was unpopular in these Western European countries. And so you got Germany there. Partially what we're dealing with is this change from Merkel to Schultz and Schultz appears to sense the politics are different than maybe what Merkel might have. Um, but then, you know, Switzerland, these play people that are not known to being particularly aggressive about sanction. And so the coalition in part emerged as, as Russia's actions became clear. And you saw like a really quite one-sided vote in the UN General Assembly, which I think indicates people's displeasure about what's going on. And, you know, I, I think Putin has almost certainly made Russia um, less safe than it was 10 days ago. Um, he, that whatever his goals are have been nullified by the fact that the Germans are gonna increase their defense spending. Uh, I, you know, Finland and Sweden are gonna get closer to NATO. They may join NATO for God's sakes. Uh, and, and then, you know, I don't know what will happen, whether Russia, I don't think Russia will probably go all the way to the present territorial boundaries of Ukraine, but the rump Ukraine is going to be a, a pain. Uh, I don't think that rump Ukraine will join NATO because I don't think NATO wants to be, have a member that has an active on, you know, ongoing front, but the EU has obviously indicated that it might get closer to it. So you, you've just, you've tightened the ties between Western Europe and the and you've increased the security ties. The US will probably keep, I would guess, a couple few thousand more troops there. It's That's gonna complicate the rebalance to Asia modestly. But the fact that the Russian army has like sucked so far in this conflict also will, will decrease what the US needs to do to keep make the Western European states feel more secure. Um, and I think, you know, uh, so you've, you've kind of reaffirmed those old ties of, in Western Europe in a, in a way um, they reminded everybody why why people cooperated um, uh, because you didn't want these these Russians to come in. And then I think what's what's interesting is the alignments in Asia, right? Where we we've already mentioned the China relationship is going to become indispensable for Moscow. And what's unclear is whether India is left as kind of like an odd person out. Right, India has 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 maintained a relationship with Russia in part so that Russia didn't feel overly tied to China um, as, a, as a wedge strategy by India to try to make, to, because India has its own problems with China. And Pakistan has, has used that, and, and Imran Khan went to Moscow like the day after the invasion at like a really bad timing in terms of the international community. So that realignment, I think, can, on go, can go on as well as you've, have you tightened up um, the old order. And then I, I think it, it's not at all clear to me, as, as Brian said, we might be getting to something much more similar to the Cold War economic landscape, where you have these blocks with China kind of with a foot in both realms. Um, and and that, is, that is fundamentally different than the globalization picture we had for the last 30 years. I just want to chime in on that, is, is there was already kind of on the US side, um, an effort to get countries around the world to start uh, thinking more strategically about China's rise and about how the contributions of their technology, their infrastructure, and and what uh, what governments are providing to China that can enable China to enhance its military and continue to grow more powerful. Uh, those efforts had also been uh, directed at at Russia, and and so. Um, this gets to at least one of the one of the questions in the in the, in the chat as well is if Russia is cut off uh, from from strategic technologies and in, uh, in the international system, it's going to become, I'd say, predominantly relying upon China, but potentially maybe India as well. Um, but but if if it's selling a lot of its exports to China, it's going to need to buy something with them. And that means China's Chinese technology and Chinese um, dual use uh, equipment are probably going to uh, be the lion's share of what, what uh, Russia is going to be acquiring. Um, so what does that do? I mean, it, it potentially provides a market, much broader marketplace for, for Chinese companies. Um, it also then potentially um, means that, that China is the diversion point for evading sanctions if you want to sell things to Russia. Now, China's a massive market. And so when we've seen sanctions cases against places like Iran, they've used smaller neighboring countries like the UAE and Dubai specifically. Um, but 
what's pretty easy to tell with a place like small uh, country like the UAE is if they're bringing in way more stuff than can be consumed domestically, you have a strong sense that it's going somewhere else and you have a strong sense of where it's going to, the neighbor that really wants it. Uh, with China, I mean, the, the economy is so vast, um, it's going to be a lot easier for things to be diverted into China and to get lost within Chinese, China's domestic marketplace and then redirected uh, to Russia. And so, uh, what does that mean? Well, it means increasingly that uh, I think the US and other concerned parties uh, are going to have to treat Russia and China as part of a bloc, uh, that they're going to have to treat them very similarly, and that if, if you trade something to China, you're trading it to Russia. Um, and so that that's kind of bringing us back to a, a Cold War mentality when we had the, 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 the COCOM and SHINCOM export control regimes that sought to um, limit technology, uh, limit uh, uh, strategic trade with uh, both China and the Soviet Union. So um, I see as an enduring effect of this is that we're, we're going to be, be um, breaking up into economic blocks much more. Now, there are countries in the world who are not going to say we're going to take an us versus them mentality. Um, we're going to trade with the US, we're going to trade with China, and we don't, we don't want to go that. And that's understandable. Uh, but I just want to say that this is a, a major break kind of in the post 9-11 environment um, in which all countries kind of viewed the risks of weapons of mass destruction as being a collective threat to global security. And it was viewed as a, as a global obligation for, for countries uh, to prevent against the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction to non-state non actors or terrorists, uh, but also um, more rogue regimes like Iran and North Korea. And so um, I, I, I see a lot of the, those efforts potentially um, losing a lot of a lot of the impetus behind them. Um, and, I, and I see a much more divided global economy and a much more divided um, um, international political space as well. Uh, that uh, this definitely is, as Professor Clary indicated, um, kind of reforged the, the frayed ties between the US and Europe um, that, that had had emerged during the Trump administration. Um, and if anything, I, I think it revitalized uh, the idea of NATO um, um, with Sweden and Finland in particular, uh, but also I think a, a common European identity after, after Europe was in a little bit of a, a funk post-Brexit. Um, I mean, just seeing how much Ukraine wants to be part of Europe uh, I think was kind of a powerful message and how Europeans thought we need to intervene to help Europeans. And, um, and so I, I think that that does, uh, I think that is a major miscalculation, uh, as uh, Professor Clary said, of, of this military adventurism on the part of, of Russia. Um, it has strengthened um, um, the, the West in a way that I, I don't think I, I, he, he didn't anticipate. Um, and I think that's a really significant outcome of all of this. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're going to move to some of the questions in the chat now. I see the first question um, is from Kevin. He asks, in 1946, the Nuremberg International Military Tribunal indicted Nazi officials on four counts, including the crime of uh, crimes against peace. The crime was for the planning, uh, preparation, and execution of war. One defendant was Martin Bormann, who was indicted while being absent from the trial. Can the war crime case against um, Russia proceed, even though the Russian officials are not present at the trial? You want this one, Chris? You know, I saw, let me, uh, I saw a, a statistic I wanted to give on this actually. So, you know, I on issues that I feel like I don't have a close handle on, which is one of these, uh, I often say, okay, what is the crowd saying to a first approximation? So there's um, a prediction 
another, I, I mentioned one prediction market today. There's another one where it's just like a reputation based market. So hundreds of people say what they think will happen. And when, it, when they, after it resolves, then they get, you know, just basically rewards, right? And, and you know, there are questions now about will Putin be charged for war crimes by the International Criminal Court? And the current community prediction above hundreds of people is about 75% likelihood that he will be charged with something. And that seems about right to me um, that this is, that if it's, it may not be this, you know, crime against peace, uh, you know, but it, it might, there, there are going to be plenty of examples. You, you don't use artillery against populated areas without having lots of reasons to indict someone. And I should note uh, that indiscriminate against violence against civilians was a Russian MO in Syria and elsewhere, but it was off, off of the daily, you know, breaking news of CNN. You know, and part of that is the easy accessibility of, of Kyiv uh, to, to Western journalists. They can literally drive there in a car, um, you know, from, from Poland and elsewhere. Uh, and then part of it, I think, uh, I'm, I'm feel pretty confident, is just the racism of, of Americans that are more worried about white people dying than they are about, about brown people dying, right? And I think that's, I think you've really seen that in the discussion about immigration. You know, the head of the Bulgarian prime minister is like, oh, these are white people. We'll let them in. You know, this is different than when the Muslims tried to come in after Syria. So, so that has riveted the world's attention. Um, and that probably has had some effects that Putin did not anticipate. But, um, you know, the, at the end of the day, you know, you can indict Putin. You can make it hard for lots of Russians to, to have vacations in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, but these are all marginal costs. Uh, and, you know, I, I just to kind of go back to something that Professor Early quite rightly pointed out, can you identify a path to get Putin to stop because he's done a lot of horrible stuff already, but he has nuclear weapons. And so there are just some things that are off the table. He commands a great power. So are you making a bet that you can punish Russia so much that he falls? That's, that's rare. That's a rare thing to do. We don't have a lot of evidence that we know how to do that. Now we're using tools we don't use very often. You know, so maybe we can we can pull it off, but it is. I think it's important to think about like, can you give him something um, to, before before he takes Kiev? Really, I mean, I, I I think we're talking thousands of civilians, if not more, could die in, in the urban warfare of Kiev, and and I think avoiding that is is really important, and. You know, there are other things you can and are, the UN is doing, like getting people, getting, trying to get all the civilians out of Kiev so that these kids are not, you know, stuck when the artillery is coming in, for God's sakes. Uh, but it's very hard to craft off ramps when somebody has engaged in aggression as blatant as what as Putin has. And as I think the questioners indicate, how do you create off ramps for war criminals? You know, because mo marching on Moscow isn't an option. Right, that's not an off ramp that's available to us. Just and and this is where targeted sanctions. I um, I I, I want to go back to this point of of are are you intending to accomplish something? Are you tending to punish or stigmatize? Um, because there's a revulsion to the idea of providing golden parachutes. Uh, but when you impose targeted sanctions against uh, war criminals or human rights abusers, what you get um, in some cases are the incentive structures of a Gaddafi, uh, uh, of um, uh, As Assad's uh, in Syria. If, if leaders who do bad things and make bad choices and paint themselves into a corner have no off-ramp, then it means they have every incentive uh, to do anything they possibly can uh, to stay in power. Um, and so that, that's one of the things where if, if, you, if you are freezing the bank accounts, if you're going after Putin's money, if you're going after the oligarch's money uh, abroad, and you're saying, that's ours now, you're never getting it back, you did horrible, horrible things, um, then it gives them little incentive 
um, to try to negotiate or make concessions other than uh, as opposed to doubling down and trying to improve the leverage they have or, or just trying to resist. If you indict Putin as a war criminal, um, it's going to tarnish his reputation and his legacy, and I think he, he will hate that. Um, but it also, I mean, in terms of if you could hope for any sort of a transition of power or, or other things, um, or get him to step down, I don't think it advance, necessarily advances the, the cause of that. Could it deter potential people in the future, though, from engaging in aggression, uh, because that will tarnish their legacy? Uh, yes. Uh, and so I think you've got this really complex interplay of um, thinking about wanting to do what's what's righteous or just in terms of punishing bad behavior, thinking about how those punishments could deter similar bad behavior in the future that you want to stop versus how you actually get the actors who have decision-making authority um, to behave in, in more desirable ways within the particular crisis that you're dealing with. Um, so I I guess that's, that's where I see, but I mean, um, if you... I don't want to engage in whataboutism, uh, but there were things during the Iraq war with Abu Ghraib and, and some of the black sites that the CIA operated where there was a push in the international community uh, to hold people who were responsible for that accountable. And it went nowhere. Um, and the large reason it went nowhere is the United States is a great power and there's really no ability to affect that type of punishment on the United States. And I think in a similar way, um, there's not going to be pragmatic movement on anything that would be done against Russia or, or Russian key officials, because Russia is frankly too powerful, um, I, I think, to, 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 to force something like that either. Um, so there are, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to trivialize it and say that it wouldn't be meaningful and that it couldn't have actual consequences. But I think in, in, do, in doing that, though, um, I think it wouldn't necessarily be, it's not a strategy for constructively uh, getting to an outcome in this particular crisis um, um, right now, even if it does have, have some broader significance in what could be a takeaway uh, or a message to other leaders potentially considering engaging in international aggression or, or uh, war crimes in the future. Thank you. Um, and, and so I, actually, I think that, you know, the next couple of questions that we have, um, you guys actually uh, addressed pretty much head on. Um, but I did just want to, um, in, in terms of Michael's question about, you know, whether or not, you know, Putin's kind of banking on this being over uh, relatively shortly so that this, this economic pain will be, you know, kind of in the short term. Um, but in terms of, you know, what the intelligence community, uh, community would be looking for, I mean, what 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 is the intelligence community going to be looking for in terms of seeing the political effects of these sanctions and of of this pressure on Russia? Again, they're going to be looking at how Putin is kind of interpreting them. Um, we've had some reportedly out in the press, some sources um, coming forward to the community and uh, you know, expressing sort of his anger and frustration and some insight. Um, so if the Intel community has access to those types of sources, that is great. I think with anything though, they need to be careful with people coming out um, with the, you know, attempt to influence, um, albeit negatively. Um, but there, I, it's hard to say not being in there. Um, but again, they're gonna be looking at, you know, what, how, are these sanctions sort of changing if any Putin's end game and what are his next moves, if any, and whether or not this turns out to be relatively successful for him or not and going further with sort of his, you know, alleged like conquest to kind of take over some of these countries surrounding him. So they're trying to be, they're trying to gather whatever sort of credible information they can um, from the regime, from some of the technical sources about, you know, what he's planning to do next and kind of going from there and sharing that information with the policymakers back home. And, and Charles, on this, you know, it's a classic case of, uh, you know, this intelligence distinction people make between mysteries and secrets, right? So, 
it how a regime handles these sorts of, of pressures, you can infer based on listening to phone calls and human intelligence assets and all those things. So you can listen to those conversations and you can try to assess. But you know, regime crumbling is a really tricky phenomenon and it and it can tip weirdly and and it's really tough to know. Um, so the intelligence community can watch some indicators and might even be able to see some plots forming. Uh, but they they'll they'll that will be really tricky. And then you know the secrets, the intelligence community it seems like it has indicated they're really up in the in the Russian skivvies, you know. At no point in this crisis have they done anything that surprised the U.S. intelligence community, except for maybe be a little less competent than perhaps we assessed they would be. So, so, but that I, I think the um, the Biden administration has been quite creative with just over and over and over again. This is what the next false flag we think is going to happen. This is when you know this is what we think he's up to. He's going to invade. He's going to bring Belarus in. Bam, bam. Just every. Just that getting that declassified as a non-trivial lift, and they did it over and over again. I think they partially did it because they have so many sources; they weren't worried about burning one particular source. And um, but even with all those sources, you know, I don't think you're going to know whether a coup plot is 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 going to succeed until it succeeds or not succeed, right? Like these things get really really flaky real quick. And I would just say the U.S. wants no part in any coup. Uh, this this is this is one of the things of of just to, to Michael's question as well about bringing a knife to a gunfight. Um, there there are cons the other part as much as the United States is doing on the sanctions fronts, there are red lines um, that exist in nuclear armed great power relations. Um, a no fly zone. Uh, I heard on WAMC they, they there were people say, oh, one of one of the the commentators said, well, I can understand not wanting to do a no fly zone because they don't want American pilots dead. No, we don't want American pilots dead. But a no fly zone over Ukraine is committing to engaging in direct military conflict with the Russians. And when you have direct conflict between two nuclear armed great powers, you have non-trivial possibilities of those conflicts escalating, getting more and more severe. And if you can work backwards from the end game, which is end game is nuclear war uh, that destroys both countries in a large part of the world, and you work backward from that of, well, how does a nuclear war get started? Well, it becomes a tit for tat that could escalate very quickly. Um, so the red lines are you avoid direct military conflict um uh because that is a not get that allows for a conflict to escalate potentially in unpredictable and uncontrolled ways even if you say my red line is oh we're only engaging in the airspace of russia uh well what if they start retaliating against uh places where the airplanes are coming from in neighbors like poland or, or other places once again if you work backwards from we don't want to end the world with nuclear war then you've got to become be very very careful in how you approach uh, um, going over red lines that could lead to escalation. Another red line is um, traditionally the United States and, and Russia Russia crossed this red line to, in a nebulous way in uh, the, the, the electoral interference um, during our elections. Uh, but you don't forcibly try to remove a fellow great power leader from power. Um, that's, that's another typical uh, red line uh, that... Uh, state great powers are very careful with. So uh, there are reasons that that the uh, Biden administration, for example, in Russia said it was it was raising its its nuclear preparedness level. Biden's response was, no, we're not doing that. This doesn't change anything for it. They're trying to keep a tamper on, on the risks of this escalating. And in part, uh, because Putin thinks that by elevating the risk level of, of engaging in nuclear brinksmanship and being more tolerant of these risks, that that can give him, give him more leverage. And so the Biden administration's kind of steadfast refusal to say, we're not going to play that game. We're, we're not turning this into a, a, a giving a nuclear dimension to this, I think is, is very important, but it also does create, um, I, I would say, uh, um, boundaries for what what the West can and should do in, in terms of responding. Thank you so much. I think in terms of sanctions, it's very interesting. And many of the questions that we have in the chat are um, in terms of sanctions and the way that we're learning about them. And I think uh, Shujit uh, 
asked a really important question. Um, they asked, are these sanctions and the way we're learning about them in the media also building the narrative of Russia as a pariah state? Um, Professor Early said these are unprecedented times in modern times. Um, how severe are these sanctions? Um, and are how severe are they going to be? How severe do you predict them to be? Uh, that has compared to the sanctions that have been historically imposed on the pirate states of Iran and North Korea. Um, and then there's a second question there, but I'll let that yeah. kind of. So, so I'll actually answer the second, like Farzine's question. Um, is there farther to go? Yes. Um, um, I mean, if you look at the sanctions against DPRK or against Iran, um, the DPRK are kind of the most extreme cases, but it's a small, relatively isolated country um, in which China is its main portal now, economic portal to the rest of the world. Uh, there are very few sanctions left to put on the DPRK. There are many sanctions that can continue to be put on, on Russia. Um, we've gone after, um, we've kind of, We've, we've gone from 15 miles per hour to 60 miles per hour very, very, very quickly in terms of um, the escalation ladder of the most powerful sanctions that we could put into place. But there are a lot of filler sanctions in terms of going after other types of sanctions on commercial commodities. The big one is energy. Um, energy is kind of a, a kind of a dual, there, there, there's a double-edged sword to energy sanctions against Russia. On the one hand, um, it can really, really harm global energy prices, which harms the West, harms the US, harms Europe. Um, there's also a flip side that if the the uh, price of oil uh, or natural gas spikes too significantly, that Russia could sell less, but actually make more. Now, the problem is, if, if Russia is having a harder and harder time making those sales, then maybe it's not going to be able to make up for that. Um, but there's a lot left that, that can be sanctioned with Russia. Um, in terms of, of the dynamic of how, has there been a contagion effect or, or has there been a pylon effect? I think definitely. Um, I think that the potency of the, the what Professor Clary said of, of um, just the, the, the nature of the invasion was so shocking, even though the United States had been signaling it and telling everybody it was going to happen, uh, that a lot of countries and actually a lot of companies felt compelled to join the sanctioning efforts and to no longer be doing business with Russia, um, at least in, in terms of that initial of everyone wanting to show um, that they disagreed with Russia was doing, that they wanted to contribute to the stigmatization and punishment of Russia. Um, so. I do think that there was a viral effect or a contagion effect. Uh, the fact that Taiwan uh, got involved in putting sanctions and semiconductors on, on Russia, that's huge. Now, this is the second part, though. It's one thing to put the sanctions into place on paper. It's another thing to enforce them. And a lot of this is a lot of my, my, my research that shifted from sanctions, how countries evade sanctions, and now my research is on how countries enforce sanctions. Very few governments in the world have the capacity, uh, uh, the bureaucratic capacity to impose sanctions at the level the U.S. government does. Um, European, European governments, by and large, do not. Certainly, most Asian governments do not. And so uh, what's going to be telling in the long run um, is how willing the governments that jumped on the sanctions bandwagon and put them in place on paper how serious are they about actually forcing their companies to comply with the sanctions? How serious are they about monitoring whether or not Taiwan, uh, Taiwanese uh, semiconductors that are being sold to China aren't ending up in Russia? Uh, how willing are they to punish companies in China that are reselling products uh, to, to Russia? Uh, especially with some of the legislation China has in, in place to punish actors that try to impose sanctions on China. Um, that's the second order question. And can the enthusiasm that got countries to impose the sanctions in the first place, how long does that carry over into the actual implementation and enforcement sanctions? Um, and I think that's a, that's a very interesting question because it will require really significant like government capacity building investments uh, by states to implement that they haven't been willing to implement in many cases uh, to impose sanctions against the DPRK or even sanctions against Iran uh, on anything other than more of an ad hoc basis. Um, and so this is where um, 
I see kind of the bigger question being of, of how much is that political willingness to impose the sanctions going to be translated subsequently into developing a capability to actually enforce them. Uh, you do get some a significant, you get a disruption effect by putting it in place on paper. Some companies will comply uh, just because they want to follow the laws, uh, but a non-trivial number of com companies will not they will look for loopholes and they will look to un undercut them. Um, and then it's what do governments do? How serious are they about following through? And that's where I think there's the, 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 is going to be the really interesting questions of the slippage um, of, of the, the, this, this, this multilateral moment in the West and, of, of, and democ democracies worldwide. Um, how serious are they about that? And that's where I think the US government um, is going to try to capitalize on this uh, um, this moment um, and as, as well, and so we'll see. And and just so we all know, we have about uh, ten minutes left, so we're kind of winding down here. But I do want to just try to get to as many questions uh, from the audience as possible. Um, so just from uh, Charmaine uh, asked a question, um, saying that some have said that uh, Putin's impetus for the invasion of Ukraine was primarily based on the prospect of. A Ukrainian membership in NATO and or the EU. Um, what are your thoughts uh, on that argument? Um, was did, did Russia feel legitimately uh, menaced by the, the presence of a potentially, uh, you know, potential uh, NATO membership for Ukraine? You know, I'll, I'll take a jump at this. You know, I, uh, I had an old professor who I think he was quoting an old professor of him, and he said, "If you show me something in the world that only has one cause, I'll show you something that didn't, didn't happen." Right. So uh, there is, I think, a legitimate debate to be had about how much um, Putin was motivated by what we might call, you know, greed motivations with his invasion of Ukraine, his desire to recreate an empire, have status that could flow from, from undoing some of the damage that he saw as a young man when the Soviet Union collapsed versus how much he was worried that the West was wanting to build uh, a set of liberal institutions that came right to Russia's doorstep and had uh, in the George W. Bush administration uh, brought Ukraine in as a partner, not as a NATO member, but has started a process that the U.S. has a, you know, a giant embassy in Kyiv uh, that had a relatively large military section that was working to make the Ukrainian military better. All of those things, um, it's not crazy that a great power be worried about them. There was a Politico story a few, a year ago, roughly, when I think, I forget what it was, I think a Russian ship went to Venezuela or something, uh, and it became like a, 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 you know, a Twitter story for a day. Um, the U.S. kind of freaks out every time China or Russia does something in Latin America, and those, you know, that's, that's kind of what happens. States are, are in their backyard are not prone to generous reading of their adversaries' behaviors. Uh, but you know, it's that that is uh, th that doesn't. People can be upset about things and can try to take steps to manage it uh, that don't lead to the bombardment of of major cities with artillery, right? Like so. So I I think the U.S. If U.S. was like we need to have this open door to Ukraine. And it contributed even in a small way in Ukraine getting invaded. I think it's like an, there should be a little soul searching about whether we contributed and whether we could have done things to make it less likely this would have occurred. That doesn't excuse this war criminal out there. Just like when you do something that makes it easier for you to have a that somebody like robs you, like you're in the bad neighborhood, you know, both of those things are true. Somebody did something immoral and wrong and illegal, but you may have engaged in a behavior that increased the probability of that thing occurring. And it's very tough because we have these normative things that go on at the exact same time. Um, and, you know, I, I would a neutral Ukraine that wasn't able to get ever closer to the EU and NATO, could that have spared this from happening? Maybe. Um, and that to say that shouldn't excuse what Putin is doing. It shouldn't excuse the fact 
that he's 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 you know in the process of, of blowing up children in these towns, right? So, but but as analysts, we should be thinking like, how do we make the world better on average? And, and is this kind of project did it make sense? The the reality is, through his actions, Putin has accelerated that project, right? He is he, the the Europe is going to get closer together, and I think at a minimum. Finland and Sweden are going to become much closer to 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 the to the U.S. and NATO, and that just again encroaches even closer to the Russian border. People that are wary of him um, and that will be better armed, and too, so this never happens to them. And and just to chime in on on what what Chris said, the poor showing of Russia's military, um, I I think increases the desire of countries to want to join NATO because the view that would would Russia pick a fight with NATO given what uh, given how its military has shown itself it, it it seems unlikely or less increasingly less likely that Russia would have the wherewithal to really genuinely pick a fight with a NATO member um, given that its military was prone to be. Uh, can be viewed to be weaker than was actually thought. Um, and so if you can join NATO to be to deter Russian aggression just by being part of it, um, I think this this has enhanced the attractiveness of, of being a part of NATO uh, for for many of those 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 countries, uh, uh, both in terms of seeing ru what Russia did in terms of being aggressive against a non NATO member, but also that if you are a NATO, uh, you, you seemingly will be much better protected. Uh, as well. Thank you. Um, so for our last question, um, we are running out of time, but I think this is really important to address. Um, Professor Kozlowski asks, can the debt star sanctions, especially if supplemented by sanctions on oil and gas, be considered by Putin as economic war that crosses a red line for escalation to military actions against the US and NATO. And this kind of is one of the questions I had um, had as well in terms of what is Putin's mindset? What is the kind of intelligence that we have on Putin's mindset and what could escalate his um, idea of World War III happening or an economic war with NATO? So, so I guess what I, what I would say is that, that using it as the impetus to start a kinetic, uh, kinetic conflict, I, I don't think we're there. Uh, my concern um, is that Russia will use it a, as an impetus to respond with cyber attacks. I, I mean, they can't, they can't compete in, in terms of uh, imposing costs, like counter sanctions aren't gonna work. I mean, actually Russia engaged in counter sanctions vis-a-vis -vis the mid-level um, sanctions that were imposed against Russia and Crimea, like they sanctioned U.S. poultry exports uh, and food exports uh, um, from European countries. So um, dairy products from the Baltics and cheeses from France. Like there were counter sanctions that Russia imposed after the Crimean sanctions that imposed corresponding costs on the West that originally sanctioned them. And that, that was how they retaliated. Um, there is no equivalent that Russia has to respond to the sanctions that the US and Europe and other countries have, have responded with. Uh, what Russia does have is cyber capabilities though. Um, and, and so I, I don't necessarily see this as being them say lift the sanctions or we're gonna start a, a, a kinetic war. Uh, but what I think we're gonna see is, is a probably a pretty significant um, uptick in Russia's cyber operations meant to punish uh, it's, it's so not not escalation totally kinetic, but I think we're going to see a cyber response. Um, that's that's my that that's where I see es escalation happening. Uh, the the uh, only thing I would note is you know, North Korea spends a non trivial amount of effort also now just like stealing bitcoins from people. You know, it's like so so there are. Uh, the uh, that there can be some economic on the margins benefit to engaging in some of these attacks as well as um, signaling. But you know, nu nuclear weapons are good for some things and not other. I do think we'll, Russia could try to play a game of negotiating with a gun to its own head, which is something that that Pakistan has done very well with, uh, and North Korea as well. And uh, and if you really think the society is starting to get fragile, 
um, no one wants to go through the chaos of the 89 to, to 91 period again, where it was kind of literally like keeping track of all of Russia's nuclear weapons was was pretty hard. And you, and that sort of collapse I, risk, I think, would cause the U.S. government to to and to rethink um, the severity of what's going on there. There is some negotiating advantage that comes from that. And so Professor Morrison, let's give something to add to that. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Just um, finally to to add, um, you know, to Brittany's question, and I, I would agree with Dr. Early that the most likely course of action for them will be um, to engage in some additional cyber warfare. They've already done a little bit of it, um, but I think that's that's really what's been communicated down um, to us at the state and local level and to the private sector. Um, from the feds and then in terms of just continuing to to evaluate like his mindset and what he might do next i mean i think that's a priority of the intel community analysts um i don't know if they're there yet with a final assessment um but i don't think it can be released publicly at this point in time either so thank you so that that takes us to the the very end we are one minute over um so i don't want to take up too much more of uh, all of your time uh to the panelists thank you so much for agreeing to do this we really appreciate it uh if everybody out in the audience could just hit that clap reaction uh for these guys that'd be great um or, or the heart yes thank you all right um uh, again, you know, uh, thanks everybody for coming out. Um, if this is your first time at a SIA event, we hope to see you at uh, at future ones. Um, and then, um, you know, professors, if you have any any parting words for for students on the way out, um, that'd be great. But otherwise, we can call it a day. I think there's a rally going on uh, at the Uptown campus for Ukraine as well. Um, I'm not sure if, if anybody's seen seen that uh, advert, but uh, I know they're, they're doing something at the Uptown campus as well to raise money for the humanitarian effort for Ukraine. So uh, just put a plug in for that if anybody's interested. Yeah, so the organizer is Liam Vaitkus, uh, V-A-I-T-K-U-S. At least that's who reached out to me. It's at 1.30 to 2.30. Uh, at the small fountain um, uptown. So maybe you could track him down if you wanna 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 find that. If that sounds like something you wanna support. Uh, so I just wanted to echo that. And uh, everybody should do their readings. That's my other professor advice. So anyway, uh, have have a good weekend, everyone. I know it doesn't start for another day, but. Uh, thanks again uh, for allowing me to participate uh, today. Just one quick comment. I saw a question or two about disinformation. So students, as you are, you know, gathering information on this topic, reading through your Twitter feeds, um, just be aware of the amount of disinformation that is out there, either directly from the Russian government or the Russian government behind somebody else, people just starting rumors, uh, rumored, rumored, rumored intelligence, as I'd like to say. Um, so if you're parlaying this into a final research paper for the semester, just make sure to check your sources before you're conducting your analysis. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a, have a good day. <laughs>